Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus Sources Edition, presented by WinBet. This is the BBOC podcast that ties Big J journalism to Big Bets. My co-host, the award-winning, news-breaking Action Network's own Brett McMurphy, and I am Action Network senior writer Colin Wilson, a guy that will keep on betting LSU when Ty Davis Price is running like it's 2019 for LSU and trying to get the Heisman. Brett, what's your tech takeaway from week seven? Uh, not just the scoreboard, but do we got, we got to start with coach O, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, you know, I think it was pretty evident that coach O would not be back with LSU next year. Uh, you know, he said that basically after the loss to Kentucky, that that's when Scott Woodward kind of gave him the heads up. This was not going to, this was not going to be long-term. And I understand why, you know, he basically LSU has been a 500 team since winning the, the national championship in 2019, but also there's a lot of other things going on behind the scenes. They've got currently, they've got some title nine issues going on that we talked about last week. Coach O may or may not have knowledge of some of those things that went on and then just kind of how he handled himself as a head coach, you know, it's, it's, fun and you know it's it's great for a, a click on twitter when he, you see him saying uh, hey, you, hey you in the sissy blue pants you know mm-hmm. but and but you know come on could you imagine you know Saban saying something like that no it's you there's a way to handle yourself when you're in public uh Ogeron did not do that very well that's what made him so polarizing and when you're winning national championships schools are fine with that but then when you start losing and then you start seeing, hearing about some things behind the scenes. You see a number of LSU players that, you know, either opted out or didn't play because of injuries. Then you're wondering, are they not playing because of Ogeron? And bottom line is, Scott Woodward has made some tremendous hires in his career. He hired Chris Peterson at Washington. He hired Jimbo Fisher at Texas a and uh, This guy makes big time hires and I expect him to do the same thing at LSU because you look at LSU the last three coaches that have been there Nick Saban Les Miles and Ed Odron they all won national championships there's not a lot of schools that can say that no there's not and I mean LSU is a great program they are in a very rich territory for recruiting uh they you know I mean Listen, Coach O, he doesn't fit the profile of a head coach, but at least with this job, different from USC and different from Ole Miss, is that he knew that if he would be more of a uh, maybe like a counselor to the players and let the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator do their jobs, that probably things would get done a little bit more efficiently. And that happened when Steve Inslinger had Joe Brady. And that happened when Dave Aranda was around and they had full control over both offense and defense. But these hires on both sides of the ball have not worked out whatsoever. And then things started leaking out last week about how the entire offensive game plan was being changed. Running schemes were being changed. They were going to start doing a little, you know, did a little different zone blocking to see if it could amp up the running game. And then Ty Ty Davis Price is running like a madman for more yards. than I think LSU's had on the ground in in years. (laughs) Uh, and, And I think it's a little bit of a shock to see them beat Florida as a double digit underdog and for his resignation, I'm not surely if this is like truly a resignation or more of we've just come to an agreement that at the end of the year, which the joke going around Twitter right now is Coach O's record as an interim head coach is like somewhere around 80% against the spread, <laughs> 90% straight up. So he's going to do so much better. But in my opinion, this is not a fade LSU team. They just won a huge game against Florida. Now there's direction. Like we know that this is, the swan song for coach O who's been along with this program for five, six decades. He played here. He's Louisiana to the heart. And uh, you know, those players that signed up for LSU football to play for him are going to give everything that they have. These coaches are now officially auditioning for new positions somewhere else. And I, I might be playing LSU every single, I think I've already played them this week. I I am because (laughs) Matt Matt Corral is officially questionable, but I think LSU is a play on team. For the rest of the season, I, that sounds crazy. I think the general public is going to want to fade him, but it, wouldn't that – doesn't everybody have the feeling, like, let's do this for Coach O? Yeah, I think so, but, and I agree with you, and I think that's a large reason why Scott Woodward want to make this decision now. Basically, they came to an understanding they were going to get rid of Les Miles uh, when he was there, and then Miles kept winning, and so they couldn't get rid of him. 
So they did not want the same thing to happen. They did not want LSU to win out, and then you're stuck with Ogeron for another year. So that's why they went ahead and cut the cord now. Um, but you're right. You would you would think that those guys will play for O. And uh, you know the the question I wonder is, you know, will they will they let him take them to a bowl game? Because that, in essence, delays right. when the new guy comes in. Also, how many play, you know, all the talent they have, how many kids are going to want to actually play in a bowl game that's going to be, you know, Birmingham Bowl or Music City or something. They're not going to a New Year's Six game. So will they want to play in a, a lesser bowl? Yeah, it's doubtful, but that's a few weeks off. Yeah, but the bigger thing, too, is also the early signing period. That thing got bumped up to, I think it's the Friday or Saturday when the first bowls start. And you would want to have your new head coach in place at least 10 days in advance before that early signing period for recruiting. So, you know, the recruits know who that they're signing up for. So uh, I think LSU even maybe participating in a bowl, it's a interesting, I don't know who's going to be the interim coach. Do the players want to play for someone besides Coach O? Why would Coach O do it? Uh, I, that's going to be an interesting thing. So I think their last game of the season is probably going to feel like the Coach O Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm probably going to be playing LSU from here on out. We're going to have some questions in the speed round about this, but let's cover the Jimbo Fisher angle because you mentioned that Jimbo <laughs> was a very successful hire before and Jimbo came out and like wanted to make it very clear that he is not leaving Texas A&M whatsoever. And I, I, I hate to ask this. I don't want to piss any fan bases off is that would be a lateral move for him to move over to LSU. Uh, would he do it for the relationship that he's had in the past with the AD uh, I, he has everything he needs at AM. And now Texas is in the SEC. It's not like there's this big divide. Uh, I, it's a lateral move to LSU, is it? Or is uh, LSU a more prestigious I, program? I would, I would put LSU over AM because you've won, a nas- you've won national titles there. Like I said, the last three coaches have won national titles. Texas AM may have won a national title way back in the. I don't, <laughs> Texas a has not won a national title because they have a blank trophy case waiting for Jimbo to put a national title in there. So, no, I think yeah. LSU's, LSU's a better job. You're the only team in the state. Texas A&M, you're divided with the state of Texas. And, you know, about 50 other schools in Texas, obviously you're, you're one of the two biggest ones. But, yeah, he's, he's not going. He, he's not, he, obviously he knows the speculation that's out there. Everyone knows his relationship with Woodward. And also, you know, Jimbo has actually been involved in at least three times for the LSU job. And for whatever reason, mm-hmm. um, he was playing hard to get or he wouldn't pull the trigger and do it. And I think I think Woodward and the LSU um, brass are like, OK, we've 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 done the dance with Jimbo enough. He didn't wouldn't do it. So we're not even going to consider him. Uh, but grab your uh, TV guide on November 27th. LSU's final home game against Texas a and Which is very, very bad blood. Uh, teams running scores up. And then when the two teams were competitive, we're talking games going into multiple overtimes. Uh, Two-point convert. That, that is a very heated rivalry. Um, so, yeah, that is, that is definitely going to be a main TV watch with the audio. Uh, so I, I guess we'll revisit this about who we think the coach is going to be. But uh, – you know, I mean, there's just there's so many names I've read out there that I think people, all these other media conglomerates just immediately came up with 20 names. And like, I never saw anyone like Eric B like the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. I didn't see a lot of names that came to my mind. So we'll keep talking about this as the weeks go by. I'm going to move on. Uh, let's, Iowa lost, uh, you know, I mean, the Blue Bloods of Oklahoma and Ohio State, you and I have been talking about Ohio State for weeks that like the schedule's there. They're going to get back into this thing easy. Uh, Oklahoma now looks like a national championship offense. I can't really say anything about the defense, uh, but they're right back in the mix for the college football playoff. Do is it pretty much assumed that because of the way they look that they kind of just go to the top? You and I definitely are moving them, gravitating them back towards the top. But um, is it clear that our top two is Georgia and Oklahoma now, or is Ohio State up in that mix? Uh, you know, where are we going to go from here with who the top teams in the nation are? Well, on my ballot, I had Alabama number two. Behind Georgia, I had I had Oklahoma three. Uh, Cincinnati four. Uh, I got Ohio State behind Oregon. I still value head-to-head matchups. I know you don't. I know you've got Ohio State in your top four. 
Uh, the thing with, you know, talking about Ohio State, Georgia, Alabama, and Oklahoma, and all the crazy upsets we've had, the more upsets we have, and if everyone just keeps beating themselves, then we're going to end up with those same four teams anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think unless everybody's got two losses and Cincinnati's the only undefeated team, we're going to end up with some kind of version of Georgia and or Alabama, Oklahoma, uh, and Ohio State. Yeah, as much as this for everybody's been screaming for chaos for seven weeks now, I, I'm starting to see a clear path where the Blue Bloods all make it. Now, that brings me to Cincinnati, a team that, you know, I thought should have made the playoff last year, continued to win games, even though I think their total game with Tulsa was delayed three, three different times. But, uh, you know, if things couldn't get any better, better for Cincinnati, uh, the only hurdle they have left, they beat Central Florida, the only hurdle they have left on their schedule is SMU. And they get SMU at home. They don't have to play Houston. Houston is not on there. This little scheduling snafu. Houston is undefeated and they don't have to play them, but SMU has to play both Cincinnati and Houston. So Cincinnati is big time in the driver's seat. We'll have to see if they stay undefeated. Uh, listen, you're not going to get in. You're not. I, I think a, a one loss Ohio state with the big 10 championship is going to easily be over Cincinnati. Right. Yeah. And, and you said, you said, well, they miss Houston. I think they, you know, they could get them in the American championship game, but right. Cincinnati needs to play more teams that are ranked. I mean, the fact they're playing, you know, these tomato cans, Navy, Tulane, <laughs> Tulsa, USF, the next four weeks, that doesn't help them at all. They can win all those games a thousand to nothing. It's not going to help them. People are going to just sit there and say, Oh, you beat a bunch of bad teams with losing records that you were supposed to beat. Who have you beaten on your schedule? That is either a ranked Notre Dame currently, or as a winning record, Right now, they're down to Notre Dame. They play SMU, and I believe that's it, that has a winning record right now. So they right now, they only have two teams on their schedule that have a winning record. You know, I know the group five doesn't get a lot of respect, but I just can't wrap my mind around thinking that a team that goes undefeated, and if they only end up playing, I guess Houston would be the third, 10 of the 13 opponents had losing records. And you beat two power fives. That to me is not a pl playoff resume. Well, they need Notre Dame to win out. They need in they needed Indiana to beat Michigan State. Indiana's in five hundred at best. I don't even know yeah. them going to bowl game now. They're probably going to be five yeah. and seven. Yeah, I mean UCF uh, is a shell of itself. I mean it, that sucks for Cincinnati, but that's the reality of it. You know. Yeah, Mikey Keene is not Dylan Gabriel, so uh, you know Central Florida was not as big of a hurdle as we thought it would be. I'm going to pivot. There's a couple sneaky teams out there that are undefeated or maybe have one loss can win their conference championship, but wakes remain at wake Forest specifically. I know this is a team that I laid a wager on a couple of weeks ago to win the ACC. The remaining schedules, Duke, UNC, NC state. That's a huge game. Uh, Clemson and BC. So there's work for wake to do, but the real focus on a power of five really comes down to the PAC 12. You and I did a great job calling Utah to beat Arizona State, but it did kind of take Arizona State out of any kind of national title contention. Uh, the Pac-12 may officially knock themselves out of the playoff this weekend if UCLA is able to beat Oregon. So are, is this probably the last time we're ever talking about the Pac-12? <laughs> if UCLA beats Oregon, yes. Uh, if Oregon yeah. wins, I, I still think they're alive. They do have the head-to-head. -head. You know, the question is, what will the committee do with the 12-1 and Pac-12 champion Oregon and a 12-1 and Big Ten champion Ohio State? Who would they rank higher? They value the head-to-head -head a great deal, but looking at the schedules at that point, Ohio State, if they do go 12-1, and they would have victories over ranked Penn State, ranked Michigan State, at ranked Michigan. So that's three wins. Oregon would have the win against Ohio State and <laughs> that's it as far as ranked teams, unless they get somebody in the in the pack, unless, unless Utah's ranked yeah. or somebody. But yeah, so you basically three ranked opponents versus none or one, or excuse me, Ohio State was ranked. So three ranked opponents for, for Ohio State, one for Oregon, but Oregon won the head to head. So how much does that, how much weight does that carry? I hope that happens. It'll be fascinating. Again, it doesn't matter what you or I think. It's a beauty contest. It's the opinions of these 13 individuals. Yeah, it's a really interesting weekend in the Pac-12 because 
if Oregon loses that game, you're potentially looking at a Utah Oregon State Pac-12 championship. Oh, they play this weekend. Uh, so, you know, someone's got to take a loss there. We might not, we might be done talking about the Pac-12 as far as national title uh, concerns and just really be talking about who's going to make the Rose Bowl. But the fact that Oregon State, the, the win this weekend goes a long way into the Beavers making the Rose Bowl. Uh, pre- pretty impressive stuff. So one, yeah. one, other thing I, one other thing I have to ask, because I know that this is going to be on the slate for our live show on Saturday, uh, 10.30 a.m. Eastern for the, you guys that haven't seen it um, uh, over on the Big Bets on Live. UCLA and Oregon playing this weekend. Is this a big deal to Chip Kelly? Like, I mean, there was, it was a mutual parting of ways. Like there's other things I want to do. I think I've taken Oregon to where they want to be. I got NFL stuff. I want, how, how big is this for Chip playing uh, Oregon? Well, it's huge, huge because of his history with Oregon, but also, you know, it's also big because, you know, Chip's trying to, you know, make UCLA relevant again and you can't, you know, make a bigger statement than game day being there and beating Oregon. Uh, maybe you can make a run at the at the Pac-12 South title. You know, they're not, they're still in the running. You know, they're obviously they're going to need a lot of help, but uh, this would be big for Chip. You know, there's going to be added incentive for him, you know, and like we said earlier, it would, it would knock out Oregon and the Pac-12 from college football playoff contention if, if the Bruins can win the game. Yeah, Oregon's got a lot of talent on his team, but those quarterbacks behind Anthony Brown are young. They have got to get a little bit older. So that'll wrap that'll wrap it up for the round table. Uh, before we head into speed round, I think you've got another uh, cliffhanger here for me. Yeah, I do. I do, Colin. So last week uh, I had a trivia question for you. We'll try another trivia question this week. It revolves around the Heisman Trophy. Who is the last Heisman Trophy winner that did not play in every one of their team's games. So I'll let you think about it for a little bit. We're going to talk about the Heisman a little bit later, and then I'll tell you who that person was. That is a really tough question because it's interesting that Matt Corral might sit out this weekend. It's a really good relevant question because Matt Corral might be out this weekend. uh, And, you know, if you're playing the long game and you're Kirby Smart, you're sitting JT Daniels half the year, not trying to win any personal awards. So... (laughs) Let me think about that one for a little bit. All right, let's transition into sources speed round. All right, so this is the segment I get to ask Brett as many questions as possible in a 60-second span. If I hear something that may have a gambling deliverable, I'm going to call a timeout on Brett. So I'm not even going to ask Brett if he's ready. We are just going to start right now. Helton's out. Coach O is out. Chad Lunsford down at Georgia Southern's all out. Is Manny Diaz going to be out before Thanksgiving? No. Will he return next year to Miami? No. Oof. Who would you hire at Miami next year? Mark Stoops of Kentucky. Who, who would you rank higher for the college football playoff right now today? Alabama, who has a loss at Texas A&M, or Ohio State, who has a loss at home to Oregon? Alabama, because of their win over ranked Ole Miss, Ohio State right now does not have any ranked victories. Joe Brady makes $435,000 with the Carolina Panthers. Is he a true leader for the LSU job? No. What are the chances that LSU goes G5 with Jamie Chadwell from Coastal Carolina doing amazing things or a Jeff Trailer at UTSA who's doing amazing things on his own? Slim and none. So true or false, the mustard bottle at Neyland was actually a flask of whiskey snuck into the game. False. As Lane Kiffin said, they're not going to waste whiskey throwing it on at him (laughs) (laughs) hell of an eight iron shot that came in on him uh so mel tucker went from five hundred thousand at georgia to 2.4 million for one year at colorado in 2019 5.5 million at michigan state will he be with the spartans next year it's doubtful (laughs) i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna call it no, uh, it's all right. Time out. Time out. You see, I, I this is the thing. This is the thing. When they said that Brett McMurphy is joining the Action Network, I knew that you were going to be sitting on a pile of information, and you're not going to. And this is it. I, I, I feel like there's some Mel Tucker information. I feel like there's some LSU information. Like, can can you shed anything about Mel Tucker but, specifically? Yeah, I, I think he could get a look at. I think he could get a look at LSU. And also, we talked a couple of weeks ago about Urban Meyer. If for some reason Urban Meyer does not return next year, I think Mel Tucker would be one of the top candidates to take over at the Jacksonville Jaguars. 
Oh, that's a, I, I didn't even thought about that, but man, props to the agent of Mel Tucker to go with, with these salary jumps. I mean, who else is exponentially building their salary from 500,000 to 5.5 million in a span of just a couple of years. All right. Clock back Wait, on. Uh, go is ahead. Is that a question? <laughs> I know the answer. Yeah. All right. Let, who, who else has gone from 500,000 to 5.5 million in a span of about four years? Chad Millman. <laughs> boss, all the drinks are on the boss, and I can drink a lot. All right, so last question <laughs> of the speed round. Dumpster fire team of the week. Colin, this week it is multiple teams. <laughs> Before you call a timeout, let me explain. It is the seven schools in the state of Florida. Look, I live in Florida, what? but it has been bad here. I'm going to name the guilty parties. Florida, Florida State, Miami, UCF, USF, FAU, and FIU. Those schools combined are 11 and 26 against FBS opponents this year. Florida is the only one currently with the winning record, and they are four and three. Hooray. Combined, they are four and 15 against Power Five opponents. By comparison, they were 18 and 14 last year. Florida is known as the Sunshine State, not now in the college ranks. The Bucks are great. The Florida colleges stink. Uh, I mean, I call a timeout on you because we have to. I think this is the thing that we need to discuss because Florida is considered a part of the Big Three when it comes to talent-rich blue chip recruits. California, the state of Texas, and the state of Florida. Is this a head coach problem, or is this a uh, is this players leaving the state? Is the is the quality of the players not there? Has the high schools gone down the drain? Uh, or is this simply a, a combination of Jeff Scott, Butch Davis, Dan Mullen, Manny Diaz? Like what, what is going on? Jim McElwain and two won two SEC East titles with the Gators, and he he was dismissed, basically. Uh, and now Dan Mullen comes in, had a great deal of success at Mississippi State. He has not replicated that success with Florida. People say, well, you know, it's still, he's still won, you know, whatever, 80% of his games, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is you got to win national championships. Steve Spurrier did, Urban Meyer did. That is the standard. Same with LSU. You got to win national championships. Dan Mullen has not done that. And I think sometimes his, he has kind of a laid back attitude. He's, he's from up North, but he's kind of, you know, I don't want to say lackadaisical, that's not fair, but sometimes, you know, he's not a big rah-rah guy or he's not going to, you know, give you a great save and sound bite. I mean, he shows up wearing Darth Vader mask and stuff. I think that, look, when you're winning national titles, when you're winning SEC titles, that's great. You know, people love it. But when you're not, then they, they use that stuff against you. But look, I'm not saying he's in any hot water, but how ironic was it that there was a coach on the hot seat, flaming hot seat, and Coach Coach O, and you know, pe- uh, numerous reporters that I follow were tweeting out, you know, are we talking about the wrong coach on the hot seat? I'm not ready right. to put Mullen on the hot seat, but certainly four and three is not what the Gators envisioned this year. Yeah, two interceptions from Emory Jones, even an interception from our beloved Anthony Richardson in that game and that loss to LSU. Uh, and this is an LSU team that's not without – as that Ricks, they don't have Stingley, and they're still, you know, just taking uh, Florida out to the woodshed. But the state in general, it's just shocking to me because I thought Norvell was going to be a great hire. Uh, there was once upon a time where Arkansas was dying to have Butch Davis – uh, you know, Willie Taggart's in there. I mean, when, when Lane was at Florida Atlantic, they were fine, uh, you know, but now all of a sudden, every single program, Jeff Scott hasn't proven anything uh, at South Florida that he can do it on his own because, you know, he's a co-offensive coordinator at Clemson. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's quite an interesting scene, what's going on down in the state of Florida. All right, we're going to segue over to the AP Top 25 versus the Action Network Top 25. So, Brett, it was really good to wake up on Sunday morning and see, like, you and I have agreement on the top three, but it all really fell apart after that. We, we <laughs> agreed on we agreed on Georgia, Bama, and OU. Uh, the AP voters have Cincinnati at number two. Uh, 42 voters in the base had Cincinnati at number two, and one voter had them at number five. 
uh, is, uh, is this a preview of uh, what's going to happen in the college football playoff rankings coming in two weeks? I mean, I, that we're only no, two so weeks the, away. The committee's not yeah. going to put Cincinnati at number two, because the reason Amazing. is if they put them at number two, then they're going to be locked in there. If they went out, how do you, how do you shuffle them down three or four spots? I think Cincinnati will come in at four. Which will be big. I mean, at least they'll be considered that they'll be in the playoff, even though they would have a spread of about 14 against Georgia. Uh, you know, as pointed out in your article on Action Network, Florida is seventh in my power ratings, but they're within four points of dropping out of the top 25. So when you do a power rating, like when you're gambling and you have your own set of power ratings, like you drop four points, you could take a big dip. Uh, so, and, and I think that's really kind of how they fell up to the number that they are. But like I mentioned, LSU had three touchdowns as a result of Emory Jones's INTs and Anthony, jo Anthony Richardson's INTs. Does Florida deserve blame or is LSU averaging 7.1 yards rush per the story? Cause really, it, I think this is the question really shouldn't be, is the LSU rush offense back? It's, is Todd Grantham going to get fired? Right. I mean, there's got it, it, four and three is Todd Grantham gone. Uh, it, it probably doesn't look good. I don't, I do not have any inside information that he will not return, but certainly you would think it, his future does not look bright right now. And that's someone that Dan Mullins brought with him from Mississippi state. I mean, there's been a long history with him and Grantham. So yeah, it should be, it, it's interesting. So I want to do a shout out to one of the voters to Colton Bartholomew of the Wisconsin state journal. He has Penn state number four, uh, but he has Oklahoma at number eight and Oklahoma state. Your Cowboys winning even got me on a tweet there after I said Bajan Robinson and you got me on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's got OU number eight and Oklahoma state at number 15. Now I I'm not as sold at Oklahoma state. I they're at 22. Uh, this game that is in Stillwater. Uh, if it was played right now, I would make it Sooners minus nine and a half. Interesting. They moved it up because they didn't, I don't know. They moved it up to the beginning of November. And they finally moved it back to, to its, you know, regular time slot that it's been for a hundred years. Uh, the Pokes have won this game twice since 2003. Are you holding out hopes on your alma mater of getting it done this year at home? Uh, <laughs> Good defense, right? You said on the BBOSA live show. Do they you covered. Said it? They, they covered. <laughs> they won. They covered. And actually, they've won twice since 2003. I was at one of the one of the two games. Uh, no. Next question. Uh, no, I, Oklahoma, Oklahoma will beat Oklahoma State. I've I've That's, seen this I've seen this movie a thousand times. Oklahoma will beat Oklahoma State. Even the paddles and the and the students all on top of you're not yeah. going to get it. Yeah, even you know gun the I've Gundy a, family. There's one game sums up the series. I'm not going to go into it because I could go 30 minutes into it. But it was the year that Marcus Dupree left. Oklahoma the week before the game and OSU blew I think it was a 20 to 3 lead or 20 to 6 lead in the fourth quarter and lost and after the game Jimmy Johnson told his radio announcer doing his post game show if I can't beat OU this year I'll never beat him he left after that year to go to the University of Miami very, very interesting that I uh, can't beat him. Might as well go do something else, I guess. Uh, and he took Michael Irvin with him. So, I, you know, and, and you know what? I knew it. 17 to three, 85 yard pick six. Here comes the Brett McMurphy tweet right back at me. He, I knew it was coming. So it was a good. Are you, are you going to, are you going to mention now or Saturday that I was five and oh in the havoc room? Oh my God. I went two and three. I had such a sub state. Oh, it was terrible. That Georgia first half. I'm still burned. Yes. You went five and oh, uh, we will make sure. That Hawaii Steph five. Oh, is my favorite show by the way. Yeah. Hawaii, the uh, best the bet loser. Oh, I was going to say Hawaii, my best bet, a loser uh, up 17 to 14 and uh, somehow did not cover a 14 and a half point spread. So yeah. Hawaii is bad word in this house this week. All right, so the Oregon victory over Ohio State, uh, you know, they're keeping the AP vote in the top 10. This trip to UCLA, which I believe right now on the board via win bet, minus two and a half on the Bruins, opened it a pick. Uh, it's a Pac-12 knockout game from a national championship perspective. You don't have another top, another Pac-12 team in your top 25. Does the Rose Bowl representative move to Utah, Oregon State winner with the with the Ducks loss this week. Like what what are we what are we doing in the Pac-12? Could we possibly see like a four loss team in the Rose Bowl this year? Look, whoever wins the Pac-12, if they're not in the playoff, they go to the Rose Bowl. So 
who is that going to be? You know, your guess is as good as good as mine right now. I mean, Wake went to the Orange Bowl with four losses, or was it five losses? I mean, there there have been four or five loss teams going to one of the New Year's Sixes. So I, it, it, we could be headed down that path real quick. Stucky and I talked at nauseum about Michigan State and their horrible post-game win expectancy on our pot or recap podcast. I believe it was about 39%, even covering the four, four and a half on Indiana. But I want to pivot over to San Diego State. <laughs> uh, you know, they're six and oh with Fresno, Nevada, Boise. They got a trip to the island to go. Uh, they're four point underdogs this week to Air Force this weekend. Uh, Bennett Conlon of the Daily Progress uh, ranks the Aztecs 10th. Uh, Brett, can you just explain to the voters a little bit about how San Diego State is in the top 25 and how big that zero in the loss column means? Apparently, it means a lot to a lot of people. There's only 11 <laughs> unbeaten teams, so maybe his first 11 teams are all unbeaten. I wonder where he has uh, UTSA. I wonder if they're in at number 11. I'm sure they're not. Uh, you know, look, San Diego State gets a lot of credit for their wins against Arizona and Utah. But, yeah, they have not been that impressive, certainly not last week against San Jose State. Um, and, we'll, you know, they have some more games coming up. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think – they're going to make a run for the college football playoff or anything like that. But if, if they ran the table, coastal Carolina suffers a loss, Oof. Cincinnati suffers a loss, maybe just maybe they could climb up and get the uh, group five new year six game. Oh, coastal's a machine. Yeah. I, I mean, before we segue out of this, uh, I can't stop San Diego state overs. Like it takes everything in me not to bet overs on this team. And I don't know what it is. It's like, when you go to a casino and you play three card poker or let it ride the house, the house has like a 70% advantage on you. You have no chance of getting your money back. And that's how I feel when I step to the table for San Diego state overs. I, I just want to bet it, see what happens. Let's have some fun. So, all right, we'll see how it goes this weekend uh, as underdogs to air force. Let's move into the Heisman handicap. All right. So these odds are via win bet. Uh, a, a little bit of movement from last week. Matt Corral's at plus 150. Uh, keep an eye. Lane said today, of course, we're not supposed to believe coaches, right, Brett? Uh, Lane said today that uh, Matt Corral's probably not going to play this weekend. Uh, he did have over 30 rushes uh, against Tennessee in that game, maybe a little beat up. Bryce Young at two to one. CJ Stroud, who you and I have been uh, pounding our chest on for a few weeks uh, when the, he was 15 to one, came all the way down to plus 550. Win bet now has him at eight to one. Uh, R- R- Desmond Ritter for Cincinnati is 10 to one. And then I'll mention some running backs. I just, I still can't see running backs on teams, you know, winning this at all. Uh, Bajon Robinson, 30 to one, uh, who he's an animal. I mean, absolute, you know, savior for Texas when, when that thing's rolling, he's hard to stop. But Brian Robinson Jr. over for Alabama at 50 to one. And I think really, I don't, know if we need to comment about any of those because we need to comment about the new guy that just pulled up a chair to the table and his name is Caleb Williams and Oklahoma is now a completely different team and uh, listen I said two weeks ago we got to put Caleb Williams in the game because he makes safeties and linebackers stay in the box and 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 really respect what he does with his legs which frees him up to throw the ball he looks fabulous from an eyeball standpoint throwing off his you know the left leg the right leg on the run hitting guys just on target Winbet currently doesn't have a number on Caleb Williams but they have the field at eight to one and that's they should just take that field off and say this is Caleb Williams he's at eight to one there was a book that left uh, uh Caleb Williams open at 50 to one on Saturday which I was happily dipping into What's the realistic chances? And, and you're going to have to help me out here because I know Trevor Lawrence came in after four games. He didn't win the Heisman. Um, you know, I know that there's probably some other presence here, but what is the realistic chances that a guy that only has 609 passing yards and nine total TDs had just one passing attempt to Kansas State, a handful, you know, before that against Western Carolina, a guy that's only played two games. What's a realistic chance this guy has winning the Heisman? I think it's going to be tough, Colin, because at the end of the day, he will have only played in basically seven full games. And how are you going to compare seven full games of what he's accomplished against 13 games against Bryce Young, 13 games with Matt Corral, uh, you know, CJ Stroud, 12 games. 
it's going to be it's going to be difficult for Heisman voters. I know every Oklahoma fan will say, well, of course, he deserves it. Barry Switzer was tweeting. Yes, he should be considered for the Heisman. Well, of course, that's their that's their guy. But if you were talking about a guy at another school, would you feel that strongly? I don't know how I would vote. And I haven't even thought about it. I guess when we get to that point, I will have to make that decision, as will the other five billion people that vote for the Heisman. I don't want to say he definitely can't win it, and I don't want to say he definitely can win it, because I really don't know. We've never really gone through anything like this before, um, which re real quick brings me back to my trivia question earlier. Who is the la last Heisman Trophy winner that did not play every one of his team's games? See, when you ask me that question, it makes me think somebody that started the season late and not somebody that was hurt. Cause I was thinking Jason white, because it just, I, I feel like that guy had some injuries that kept him out. I know he played multiple years and now I think he's selling. Oh man. I think he's selling AC units here in Tulsa. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's actually the truth. Uh, I, I, if I have to look at a, you know, think of a Heisman that maybe didn't start the season. That's a different yeah, story. I, I really want to go. I, I'll just say Jason White. I think maybe he was injured, maybe missed a game. I'm, I'm probably wrong. You probably are wrong. Yeah. 1993, Charlie Ward, Florida State. Really? He sat out their ninth game of the season against Maryland. He injured his ribs the week four against Wake Forest. He came back the following week against Notre Dame. So you have to go all the way back to 1993, the last time a Heisman Trophy winner did not play every one of his team's games. Actually, Colin, there's been five Heisman Trophy winners that did not play every one of their team's games, including Vinny Testaverde in 86, Charles White in 1979, John David Crow in 1957. But all these guys, they had injuries during the season where they missed one game. The only other example that we can compare with Caleb Williams, and I don't even think it's a fair comparison. I'm sure you remember this. I know I, I remember it well. I was, you know, a sophomore in college. 1943, Angelo Bertelli played for Notre Dame. He played in the first six games of the season, led him to an undefeated season, but then he didn't play anymore. Why didn't he play anymore? He got called to join the Marines and went off oh, wow. to fight in the Marines, even though he only played six games that year, he still won the Heisman. So I can give a guy slack for, you know, not playing the second half of the season because you got drafted and went off uh, to the, the battle of Iwo Jima. But <laughs> the fact that you didn't play your first three or four games because your coach didn't think you were good enough, that just doesn't cut it for me. So We'll have to see. We'll have to see what shakes out with Caleb Williams, but there is precedent. Not every Heisman Trophy winner has has played every game. Well, sadly, I do not remember the 1943 season, but I can understand <laughs> giving the Heisman to uh, one of our proud service members uh, for only playing, you know, not all of his games. But I am old enough to tell everybody that if you're not, you know, as old as me. That 1993 Notre Dame Florida State game may have been one of the best college football games I've ever watched in my life. So, um, of course, I'm a little, I love Lou Holtz because, you know, former Arkansas coach. All right, Woo Pig Suey, let's move into the playoff payoff. Where we won't mention Arkansas. <laughs> Listen, all right. I mean, I, I didn't get to talk about this with Stuck. Pittman came out. He said, we're beat up. We're tired. We're beat up. We're tired. And then one of the reporters, these local beat reporter guys, like, well, what do you, you know, how do you think that you're going to react to this for the rest of the season? And Pittman was looking at him like, can you say that again? How do you think you're going to react for the rest of the season? And Sam Pittman said, do you think we're going to quit? <laughs> like, no, we're just, we just played four big ranked teams in a row, right? We're beat up. We're tired. Arkansas after UAPB. And the bye week is going to be fine. We're going to a big bowl. Okay. Don't worry. All right. About it. Next, All right. next, back to things that matter. Go ahead. Back to things that matter because I don't want to be in your Birmingham bowl. Uh, the playoff payoff. All right. So Georgia is now plus one hundred. Uh, foregone conclusion that they're they're going to be in the playoff no matter if they lose the SEC championship to Alabama, who might not get there. I'm still still racked on the audio. I said that they were going to lose a game. Uh, Oklahoma eight to one. Ohio State ten to one. 
And then after that, completely drops off. Cincy 30 to 1, Michigan 30 to 1. I, and I agree with these numbers. Ole Miss 80 to 1. I don't even know how Ole Miss gets in. Uh, Oregon 200 to 1 is a one loss team. Iowa 300 to 1 can still make it if they went out. The one thing that I wanted to mention on here is I did lay $100 on NC State at 1,000 to 1 to win the national championship today. And that sounds like a joke. And I probably shouldn't be podcasting about it. But Their remaining schedule, Miami, I remember, you know, they have the lead in their, in their division, their remaining schedule, Miami, Louisville, Florida state, wake Syracuse and North Carolina. I have NC state uh, favored projected to be favorites in every single one of those games. And then what do they get after that? A coastal team at a thousand to one, I'll roll the dice. I'll easily roll the dice. You have to win seven games in a row where you're favored, thousand to one odds just to get in the playoff. That's a lot of headroom. So I'm going to, I'll throw that aside, Brett. But NC State isn't going to win the national championship, but from a value perspective, thousand to one at win bet is something that you should hit. Do you like any of the teams that, that we just talked about? Well, that was, I had two questions. One, so you would def, you're obviously going to hedge that if they got to yeah. the playoff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you just got to find like $500,000 to put on the other side. Uh, and then the other question is, so Alabama plus 225, what is that point spread wise? What would you get 225 on? Yeah, I mean, plus 225 equates to a seven point spread. Uh, you know, maybe maybe seven and a half depends on the juice on the seven and a half, but definitely a seven point spread. So there's no way Alabama would be a seven point underdog to Georgia. No, I mean, right now I would have it four and a half. So, okay. you know. So, yeah, so I wouldn't there. I wouldn't touch anything then. Yeah, and you have to think they're they're going to play each other, right? I mean, if they're both going to make the playoff, they're already going to play each other. But that may widen the gap. I mean, that plus two twenty five to win the national title. If Alabama loses that game, it's not going to be plus two twenty five in the rematch. Uh, it, it's going to be even higher. So it's uh, I don't think there's any value in taking Georgia if they lose that game. They're going to be a big dog. Uh, I don't think Georgia is going to be anything more than minus one fifty in a rematch against Alabama. Alabama that number is going to get be even better if they have a rematch. So. You know, Oklahoma, we're right back to where we started. They were eight to one to start the season. So if you didn't get it in August or July, there it is again. And as far as Ohio State's concerned, they're going to be there. But there's nothing that tells me that Kerry Coombs and this defense is ready to take on some of these big boy names. I think Oklahoma State's offense would have a field day with this this Ohio State defense. So we'll have to see how they improve as they go through their schedule. No long shots for me. I, I it feels pretty set. I mean, no, no Cincinnati for you, Brett. No Oklahoma State for you. No, uh, no outsiders really sticking out to you at, at the fifty to one range and higher. No, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't. I, nobody really liking that. Okay, so we're gonna punt on the playoff payoff this week. I am gonna say that NC State at a thousand to one is. It doesn't hurt to take somebody that can't win the national that can't win the national championship but has a shot to get to the playoff creating just a monster hedge and you know you can these people that do this in college basketball you can't hedge a futures ticket in the sweet 16 you can't hedge a futures ticket in the elite eight you can't hedge anything until you get to a semifinal. and nc state seven in a row against and they should be favored we'll see what they can do with that thousand to one all right everybody go look for your caleb williams uh heisman tickets it's a precedent even brett a heisman voter doesn't know what he's going to do which means that's opportunity for us to gamble. Uh, go find the best Caleb Williams number. Uh, as for I'll, as for Brett, this has been Big Bets on Campus, Sources Edition. Tomorrow afternoon, you can hear our red-hot group of five experts, Mike Ionello and Mike Calabrese, on our G5 Deep Dive episode. And late, late Thursday night, Stucky and I will return for our Week 8 betting preview, all right here on the BBOC podcast. Brett has to get back to literally chasing things in his phone is what he's doing right now. I have to get back to losing more money on betting Hawaii football. So thanks for joining me, Brett, and I'll see everybody at the window.